Have you ever wondered about the two witnesses mentioned in the Bible and what role they will play on earth? These are figures of great significance appearing in a world drastically changed from our own. Let's paint a picture of this world to better understand their role and purpose. Picture a world post-rapture where believers have been taken up to meet Christ in the air. What remains on earth is a period of intense tribulation lasting seven years. During this time, a man full of charisma and power emerges, captivating the nations of the earth and drawing them under his rule. This man, known as the Antichrist, initially wins hearts, even negotiating a peace treaty between Israel and Gaza. He is beloved by many, but this period of peace is short-lived. Halfway through the seven-year tribulation the Antichrist's true nature is revealed. He begins persecuting those he once defended, sowing discord and fear. It is amidst this chaos and trepidation that two witnesses make their appearance. They establish their base in Jerusalem, Israel, a region in the Middle East also home to the Antichrist. The Antichrist, also referred to as the Beast, views the two witnesses as a threat and seeks to eliminate them. But he is unsuccessful. These two witnesses, empowered by God, are untouchable for a period of three and a half years. They are the embodiment of power, and any attempt to harm them results in the perpetrator being consumed by fire. These witnesses aren't just survivors, they are prophets. As described in the book of Revelation they will prophesy for 1,260 days, dressed in sackcloth, standing as two olive trees and two lampstands before the God of the earth. Their words carry weight, their actions have consequences, and their presence is a beacon of hope in a world of despair. As we delve deeper into this narrative, let's explore who these two witnesses could possibly be. Their identities, their mission, and their inevitable end are all integral to understanding their role in this prophetic timeline. So, who exactly are these two witnesses? Let's delve into the clues given to us in the Book of Revelation. As we turn the pages of Revelation we find ourselves drawn to the description of two figures. These figures, referred to as the two witnesses, are cloaked in mystery. But their powers provide us with some tantalizing hints about their possible identities. The witnesses are described as having the power to shut the heavens so that it will not rain during the days of their prophecy a power reminiscent of the prophet Elijah. Elijah, a man of great faith, once declared a drought on the land of Israel that lasted for three and a half years, a period identical to the prophetic ministry of these two witnesses. Furthermore, the two witnesses are also described as having the power to turn water into blood and to strike the earth with plagues whenever they wish. This power mirrors that of Moses when he confronted Pharaoh in Egypt. Moses, through God's power, turned the Nile into blood and unleashed a series of devastating plagues. So, could these two witnesses be Moses and Elijah? The parallels are striking, and the similarities between their powers and those of Moses and Elijah are too significant to dismiss. These two men, revered in the Judeo-Christian tradition, embody the prophetic and apostolic dimensions of God's message. Elijah the prophet was a herald of God's truth, standing against the falsehoods of his time, while Moses, a leader and lawgiver, represented the apostolic dimension, establishing God's laws among the Israelites. In the midst of tribulation, the two witnesses will stand as bastions of truth and righteousness, echoing the roles of Elijah and Moses. But what's important to note is that their identities, while fascinating, are not the crux of their story. Their mission, their purpose, is what truly matters. These two witnesses, whether they are Moses and Elijah, or symbolically represent their roles, are God's chosen instruments during the tribulation. With their identities revealed, let's now examine their mission on earth. Knowing who they are, we now ask, what will be the main job of these two witnesses on earth? These two figures, Moses and Elijah, will rise to a significant task during a time of great tribulation. Their primary mission will be to spread the authentic gospel. They will illuminate the world with their words, shining a light on the sins of the people, and warning of the judgment that is to come. Their voices will echo through the chaos, calling for repentance and a return to righteousness. But this task will not be without its challenges. The Antichrist, the charismatic man turned persecutor, will seek their end. He, along with those who follow him, will relentlessly attempt to silence the two witnesses. Yet they will remain steadfast and unyielding. Their words will continue to ring out, a beacon of truth in a world of deception. Around them, the Christians left behind, the ones who missed the rapture, will hear their message. These are the foolish virgins, those who were not prepared for the coming of Christ. They will listen to the words of Moses and Elijah and in them, they will find salvation. 
they will accept the gospel preached by the two witnesses repenting for their past mistakes. Some will even face martyrdom at the hands of the Antichrist, choosing to die rather than accept his mark. The two witnesses will not be alone in their mission. Accompanying them will be 144,000 Jewish missionaries. These chosen ones will carry the same message of repentance and salvation across the globe, amplifying the voices of Moses and Elijah. But the mission of the two witnesses does not end with preaching the gospel and calling for repentance. Their journey is far from over, and they have a crucial role to play in the days to come. But their mission does not end here. Let's find out what happens next. Even in the face of death, the two witnesses remain unyielding. But what happens when their time on earth comes to an end? Despite their divine protection, there is a point where their earthly mission concludes. In a shocking turn of events, the Antichrist, the very figure they've been speaking against, will finally manage to overpower and kill them. This moment signifies the end of their three and a half year tenure of prophecy, a period that was marked by their unflinching courage and the raw display of divine power. The world, under the influence of the Antichrist, will erupt in what can only be described as a perverse celebration. Their death is met with jubilation, as people send gifts to each other, rejoicing over the silence of the voices that convicted them of their sins. Their bodies are left to lie in the streets of Jerusalem, an act of disrespect and defiance against the God they represented. But this celebration is short-lived. After three and a half days in a spectacle that stuns the world, the two witnesses are resurrected. A voice from heaven calls out to them, come up here, and they rise, ascending to the heavens in a cloud while their enemies look on in awe and terror. This moment of resurrection and ascension, a divine affirmation of their mission, is a stark contrast to the scorn and ridicule they faced in death. However, their departure is not without consequence. Immediately following their ascension, a great earthquake strikes resulting in the death of 7,000 people. This serves as a harsh reminder of the power and authority of the God these two witnesses served and the reality of judgment that they had been preaching about. A dramatic end to a powerful mission, but what is the aftermath of their departure? The departure of the two witnesses leaves the world in shock, but what lessons can we glean from their journey? In the aftermath of their ascension, the earth trembles with a cataclysmic quake, extinguishing 7,000 lives in an instant. The world, once jubilant in their demise, is now consumed by a paralyzing fear. The realization sinks in. The two witnesses were indeed messengers of the divine, their powers and prophecies not mere illusions but stark realities. Their journey, marked by prophecy, persecution and power, serves as a mirror reflecting the state of humanity. It unveils the ease with which we are swayed by charismatic leaders, even when they lead us astray. It exposes our inclination to silence those who dare to speak the uncomfortable truth, our eagerness to eliminate those who challenge our comfortable realities. The two witnesses, with their unwavering resolve and divine powers, epitomize the strength of faith, faith that can shut the heavens, turn the waters to blood, and withstand the mightiest of empires. Faith that doesn't waver in the face of death, a faith that speaks truth to power, a faith that endures. They also remind us of the power of repentance, their message was not one of doom, but of redemption. They did not just prophesy the wrath of God, but also the grace that follows sincere repentance. Their mission was not to condemn, but to lead the wayward back to the path of righteousness. They were not harbingers of an end, but heralds of a new beginning. In their death and resurrection we see echoes of Christ's sacrifice. Just as Christ was persecuted and killed for preaching the truth, so were the two witnesses. And just as Christ rose again victorious over death so did the two witnesses, their ascension a testament to their divine mission. As we reflect on the tale of the two witnesses, we are reminded of the power of faith and the importance of repentance in our own lives.